couple of preliminary things. I was asked to give a theology of application, which is, an, which is not so much a how-to. Um, so there won't be much how-to-do application. I don't really know much about that. Um, but <laughs> I'm hoping that this will provide some foundational principles for the how-to. Um, and the second thing is, um, two days ago, I spent the night on Mount Solitary in the Blue Mountains. Now, those of you who know me will know that it, it, was, it must have been a miracle that I got to Mount Solitary, and an even more of a miracle that I got back from Mount Solitary. But I think the thing that will take the cake is, uh, as, is whether we can all stay awake at three o'clock this afternoon. It's not just the time of the day, but it's also the fact that you're already full on a feast um, of what we've already enjoyed today. Um, so this will be like the, um, you know, that dodgy sausage that you regret afterwards. <laughs> um, it'll give you indigestion. All right, let's, uh, let's make a start. <clears throat> Sanctification is, without any qualification, a supernatural work of word and spirit. I think grasping this at the outset is crucial to defining the nature and the scope of the preacher's task. For whatever role the triune God grants the preacher in accomplishing this work, or indeed the listener to the sermon, it would be, I think, a, a serious mistake to assume that there's any delegation of power going on. There may well be a sense in which we can say that the preacher is sent with a message to proclaim. That is true. And in that respect, it is an inherently apostolic task in its character. But the apostolic messenger is not the deputy of an absent monarch. They remain forever an instrument in his sovereign hands. In dogmatic terms, the supernatural or monogistic reality of sanctification has an objective and subjective domain. Objectively, it is captured best in the notion of a divine call, not the outward invitation of the preacher, but a sovereign call, which effectually ushers a person out of darkness into wondrous light. As the New Testament speaks to this reality, the power of this call does not rest on the, community, the communicative capacities of a frail human messenger or upon the fickle inclinations of a hearer to respond as they please. Rather, it's a call which is immutable and infallible in a way that can only be described the triune God himself. It originates with the Father, we're told, for example, Romans 8, 1 Corinthians 1, and so on. And it terminates with a constellation of rich and internally enduring blessings in the lives of those who are redeemed by it. Blessings which span the entire compass of our salvation from beginning to end. Fellowship with Christ, 1 Corinthians 1, 9. Freedom, Galatians 5, 13. Hope, Ephesians 1.18, peace, Colossians 3.15, light, 1 Peter 2.9, kingdom and glory, and ultimately an eternal inheritance, Hebrews 9.15. Indeed, Paul can speak of this objective supernatural work in terms no less radical than a creative summons, akin to the word which once, once brought forth light from darkness, 2 Corinthians 4.6. Only this time... It's not a summons out of nothing, but a recreative one, or in Peter's term, a living and enduring word which brings forth new birth into a living hope from the hopeless domain of sin and death. If the subject, subjective effect of this call within a person can be summed up by the apostles as a new creation, Old Testament synonyms for this internal reality surely trace back as far as the Mosaic promise of a divinely circumcised heart, Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, through to prophetic expectations of new and living hearts that are inscribed with the law of God. Besides the image of regeneration, the New Testament also refers to the divine nature 
the implanted word or the new man, which is created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. And if all of these metaphors point to a radical subjective renewal, one which touches the whole person, mind, will and affections, entailing a decisive break with the old fleshly existence. They each only find their yes and amen in the life of the crucified and risen Christ. So it may well be the Holy Spirit who conveys the Father's sovereign call in such a way to effect this regenerative miracle within his people. But the dynamic centre of this internal renewal emanates uniquely from the life of Christ himself. If anyone is in Christ, Paul says, there is the new creation. So to be en Christo then, or united to Christ, entails much more than just the legal reality that's captured by the New Testament's forensic teaching and language of justification, as critical as that is. And even if the cultic notion of consecration, often translated as sanctification, is strictly speaking a positional once-for-all event for those in Christ, I think we neglect something crucial if we fail to see how this union also entails a radical inward change. Um, I tell my students that um, uh, it's... even if the New Testament language is strictly speak, of sanctification is strictly speaking a positional thing, um, it mustn't be, we mustn't collapse that language into the legal reality of justification. Sanctification is a, a cultic metaphor. Um, it's a cultic reality which involves, as part of that, an organic transformation. Um, that embraces what Paul refers to in Titus 3.5 as the washing of regeneration and renewal. It's to be grafted, if you like, organically into the life of the risen Christ as a branch is to a vine, John 15, verse 5. Yes, that change may happen at once, but this new organic participation in Christ's life furnishes the inward foundation which animates a Christian from conversion through to their ultimate glorification on the last day as they're gradually transformed into his image and likeness from one degree of glory to another. Moreover, to be united to Christ like this can only mean that any vital act breaking forth from the new creature is also in a very real sense the exclusive work of Christ fruit that only forms because the branch is first joined to the vine. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, Jesus says. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Um, An Old Testament antecedent um, to that image in John 15, a student, I I, I learnt this from a student last week, wonders will never cease to amaze. I learnt this from a student last week. Psalm 1, the image of the tree that's planted by the stream um, of water that yields fruit in its season only because of the vitality that that stream supplies. Um, Perhaps that's an Old Testament antecedent of what Jesus is speaking about in John 15. Not surprisingly, the New Testament ascribes effectual agency to the Spirit of Christ in producing those acts. They are quite simply the singular fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22. This special work of the Holy Spirit ultimately sits within the context of a Christian's adoption. For one of the many jewels in that crown is freedom, not just from the condemnation or penalty of sin, but also from its dominion. Of course, it's true that liberation from one dominion entails entry into another, the dominion of righteousness. Presiding over that domain is the king of righteousness who holds the keys to death and Hades on a special account of his death to sin and his indestructible life. That is to say, the events of Calvary and the risen tomb grant Christ a unique power and authority to 
to bring those realities gradually to bear in those who are called into his kingdom. But surrender to this king is thoroughly compatible with adoption because this king brings sons, we are told, and not merely subjects to glory. Hebrews 2.10. He who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all of one, Hebrews adds. And for that reason, this king is not ashamed to call them brothers. Indeed, we will reign with him, assures the apostle. It's as if we're adopted into the risen Christ's reign over sin and death in a reality that begins in seed with our conversion, gradually bearing fruit in our lives until the harvest is finally reaped with our own resurrection and glorification, when the full royal family likeness will be on display before the entire cosmos. And so while the de facto reality of our actual transformation into Christ's likeness may typically fall under the dogmatic category of sanctification, strictly speaking, it's first ours by right, de jure, because the Heavenly Father has adopted us into the kingly domain of Christ. So in summary then, the entire process of a believer's sanctification, objectively and subjectively, from beginning to end, from conversion to glory, is entirely a work of divine supernatural grace flowing out of the precious work of Christ. That is to say, it's something the Father performs on account of all the Son has accomplished in the flesh through the sovereign agency of his word and spirit. Calvin would um, sometimes label this process regeneration as an alternative to sanctification, where regeneration clearly refers to something much broader than that which happens right at the beginning of a Christian's life. And from a semantic perspective, perhaps there's something to be said for that. Even so, I think one can certainly make a case to retain the term sanctification for this broader divine work in the sense that those who are once consecrated by the Father in their conversion are nevertheless being gradually consecrated for eternal glory as the death and resurrection of Christ unfolds in their lives. Well, those once for all cleansed from sin are being gradually cleansed from sin as the life of Christ gradually bears through through them. A bit like in John 15 where Jesus says, you are clean, you are pruned, uh, katharoi, by the word that I have spoken, but nevertheless the Father prunes or cleans to bear more fruit, kathire. Either way, there's an important solus Christus logic to this unreservedly monogistic account of God's sanctifying grace. For Christ is the author of our salvation in all of its many and rich dimensions. All this is to say that whatever the role we may eventually ascribe to an individual's own activity in this supernatural work, or indeed the preaching ministry of the church, it's only ever the vocation of a servant and never that of a Lord, or what an older generation of theologians would call a means of grace. But secondly, where exactly does the concrete activity of the individual, let alone the preacher's ministry to the individual, fit into all of this? We've described something no less radical and comprehensive than a new creation. But clearly this supernatural work of grace does not break into the old existing creation in a way that disposes of or erases what's already there. What is condemned and ultimately eradicated is the old man or life in the flesh with all of its intractable, all the intractable effects of our bondage to sin. Yet the individual remains with all their agency intact. Indeed, the effect of this supernatural work is to enliven rather than to kill, to awaken our existing creaturely faculties in a way that engages them and propels them to live out their new mode of existence in a way that fittingly corresponds to this resurrection hope. 
I think Paul memorably captures this reality when he says to the Galatians, I've been crucified with Christ. And because of that, he may rightly declare, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. He now exists only eccentrically, if you like, in Christ. But the man who speaks remains recognisably the one once called Saul, who met the risen Lord on the Damascus Road. And so it is this man who continues the life I now live in the body. His subjectivity is intact. Yet the mode in which this uh, rational, creaturely subject fittingly manifests his new life in Christ is by faith in the one who loved me and gave himself for me. Faith is the fitting vessel which uniquely captures the solus Christus foundation of the new life. It is true that faith is an act of obedience to this risen king, but faith has a unique integrity that must not be reduced to obedience or some mingling of the two like faithfulness or allegiance. Christian faith is uniquely fiducery, trusting in its character. For what sets apart Christian faith from mere obedience to some command is its explicit renunciation of any claim the individual may make before God, or for that matter, anyone else, and a wholehearted relocation of that confidence squarely in the person and the work of Christ. It's an act of coming to the one whose yoke is easy and burden is light, the one who grants weary and heavy uh, rest for the weary and heavy laden souls, the one who's, uh, it's an act of believing in Christ, and synonymous with it are acts of receiving, of abiding in, of putting on, and even of eating Christ. Indeed, one of the most important breakthroughs of the early Reformation was not just to reclaim the significance of faith at the foundation of the Christian life, but to recapture the way in which the New Testament regards trust as something that is basic to the essence of Christian faith itself. This is a kind of a a forgotten aspect of the Reformation, but a very important breakthrough of the Reformation um, nonetheless. See, whereas the medieval tradition had insisted that this sort of trusting fiduciary dimension was actually supplied by a distinct virtue, the virtue of love, caritas, charity, creating a kind of hybrid between faith and love, faith and obedience, formed faith, as it was called, as opposed to unformed faith. Luther maintained that that authentic Christian faith has its own integrity apart from the love and obedience which must inevitably ensue from it. Contemporary Protestants are conditioned to recognise the the cardinal importance of faith alone as the instrument by which Christians are forgiven or justified before God, although perhaps that's no longer something that can be assumed. But what I think is less widely appreciated is the significance of faith for a Christian's sanctification. While I don't believe it's proper to speak of sanctification by faith alone, at least where the term sanctification is used in the broader sense, um, faith nonetheless remains vitally foundational throughout the entire journey to glory. A Christian never graduates from faith and then moves on to acts of obedience or good works. For starters, the two kinds of activity may have their own distinct character, but they are inseparable, and I think the medievals were right on at least that much. Indeed, according to the New Testament, love, or more specifically deeds, James 2, or good works, Ephesians 2, that collectively manifest and are summed up in terms of the two great commandments, are the natural register of faith. For if I have faith that can move mountains but do not have love, Paul insists, I am nothing. Even so, the right relationship between faith and love-rich deeds is one of root to fruit, foundation to edifice. 
as Paul puts it in Galatians, the only thing that counts is a faith that expresses itself through love. Now, once again, I, I hope there should be an, an obvious solus Christus logic to this dynamic. If it is the life of the risen Christ which animates the members of his body, the pattern in which that life begins to take shape in the activity of those members can only arise out of a constant dependence on the one who supplies them with that vitality and that strength. Paul lucidly illustrates this dynamic in Colossians 3. And there he famously issues that dual instruction to put to death whatever belongs to your earthly nature, or the old man, as he puts it in elsewhere in Ephesians, and to put on various virtues, ultimately to put on love, which binds them all together in unity. In other words, it's an instruction to enact the victory of Christ's cross and resurrection over sin in the concrete lives of those he calls his own, no less than a call to arms, a battle with the lingering power of the flesh and the image of warfare, of course, appears in other places like Ephesians 6 or Romans 7 or Galatians 5. Even so, <clears throat> even indeed, it's so famous is this mandate that it's commonly become a kind of dogmatic summary of the core business of sanctification, mortification and vivification, putting to death, putting on making alive, twin dimensions of what transformation into the perfect likeness of Christ actually entails in the daily vocation of his people. Yet to walk away from Colossians 3 without attending to the way that Paul begins that chapter, I think risks missing the point entirely, even skewing the theological and pastoral content of instruction of his instruction. For prior to any direction to enact the patterns of mortification and vivification is an exhortation to recall the soulless Christus foundation of it all. Remember that you have been raised with Christ, Paul says, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. In other words, he is your life. And thus the instruction to enact that life in the here and now, to obey, even to imitate Christ, as it were, can only grow out of a lived dependence on the vitality that he graciously provides. And the same dynamic is also visible in John 15, which I've already mentioned, where Christ's own exhortation to bear fruit that lasts is preceded by a call to abide in him, for apart from him we can do nothing. Uh, one theologian, John Webster, captures the point well. Faith refers creatures and their practices to the divine work which precedes them and brings them to life. And this is what distinguishes authentic Christian obedience from moral counterfeits, which might be formally, formally similar and laudable enough, he says, but which are nevertheless sub-Christian because they do not derive from Christ, the head of influence, the spring and fountain of spiritual life. And there he is actually quoting John Owen. <laughs> what we have described so far is a doctrine of sanctification then that attempts to capture the relationship between the divine and the individual human agent in this work to unfold, as it were, the logic of, exact, of exactly what is entailed in Paul's exhortation to keep in step with the Spirit or to work out your salvation in accord with God's work within us. On this account, the active role of the individual is entirely contained within and energised by a sovereign work of divine grace a new creation, an adoption into the kingly domain of Christ, all superintended by the Holy Spirit. And it is the priority of this divine work that determines and shapes the pattern of the individual Christian's vocation, a life that seeks to enact the risen Christ's victory over the old man in constant dependence upon him. So we're now at last 
in a position to turn to the preacher's task in all of this. For the question that remains is, how exactly does the risen Christ perform this sanctifying work of creating and nourishing the life of faith? Yes, it's by the efficient power of the Holy Spirit, the divine power of the Spirit, but there's also another, no less necessary, agent that's involved, of course, namely the written and proclaimed Word of God. And the kind of agency that's ascribed to Scripture and the proclamation of Scripture and the Word of God has typically been styled instrumental rather than efficient Instrumental in the sense that it is the chosen instrument or tool that the Spirit uses to accomplish Christ's work in our lives. In keeping with this, Paul can describe his ministry of proclamation as setting forth a kind of mirror which reflects Christ's glory. Just as Moses descended the mountain to deliver the old covenant, literally radiating the uh, glory of God, so the ministry of the new covenant with, all, with its all-surpassing glory is couched in similar terms. Only this time, the Spirit's efficiency in this ministry ensures that all veils of darkness vanish. For we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit." Moreover, the, the perlocutionary, to use a technical speech act term, um, the, in other words, the effect um, of the speech act, if you like, the perlocutionary dynamic of Christ's sanctifying work in a person's life, faith as the root of Christian obedience, corresponds to a peculiar illocutionary shape in which Christ glory radiates to us in the words of scripture. In other words, the effect corresponds to the speech act that's performed through the spirit in scripture. And we've already witnessed this shape in Paul's instruction to the Colossians, but now we can be more explicit. Before the illocutionary imperative or command, put to death, put on, there is the indicative framed ultimately in terms of a promise. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. In other words, the nature of this spiritual work within us establishes a kind of a biblical hermeneutic in which promise always takes precedent over command. Inasmuch as God expects obedience from his people, so scripture contains many imperatives or commands which obligate and define the character of that obedience. But the reality of the fallen condition with its intractable bondage renders us entirely dependent on the work of another to fulfill that obligation in our lives. And that another, the Lord Jesus Christ, comes to us clothed in the promises of the gospel, as Calvin puts it. And that's why it's not possible to speak accurately of the gospel's content, I don't think, without explicit reference to the substitutionary or priestly work of Christ. Jesus is Lord, yes, that's true, but a declaration of his lordship without mention of what he has graciously accomplished on our behalf risks reducing the gospel to mere law. Indeed, the same apostle who readily preached Jesus Christ as Lord is also said to have preached Christ crucified, and one kerugma should not be artificially prized apart from the other. For at its heart, the gospel contains promises that are animated by the authority of Christ's reign, but rooted in the priestly work of the cross on account of which he has been enthroned. And in keeping with that comprehensive character of our salvation, these promises are comprehensive in their scope, extending well beyond just the forgiveness of sins through sanctification as far as our ultimate translation to eternal glory and its prospect of face-to-face -face communion with the living God. And without those promises, the imperatives of sanctification are useless, a legal burden that will encourage moral counterfeits or worse, immoral license. 
and ultimately do little more than reinforce the sanction of the curse. So the chief task of the Christian preacher then is to unfold and proclaim the logic of the gospel with its unique combination of promises and commands as it's manifest across the kaleidoscopic terrain of scripture. Only in this way do they faithfully set forth Christ in a manner that properly corresponds to the instrumental role of scripture in nourishing the life of faith. A biblical and systematic theology robustly grounded in the authority and clarity of scripture is key to ensuring this task honours the particular way in which those promises and commands are freshly revealed in any given text. And that's a point that we've um, heard echoed at other points today. For even if the gospel may be summarised and restated by us in succinct propositional form, the mode in which it has been divinely inspired is in the rich tapestry of scripture itself, not Turretin's Institutes, but in scripture, with its redemptive historical narrative, its genres, its people, its places, its crises and exhilarating climaxes. In a sense, it's already an application of the gospel. So spiritually equipped with the mind of Christ, the preacher's task is in many ways, uh, in many respects, the same as that of any Christian. It's to ask a series of questions of the text to discern how the gospel continues to address the mind, will and affections of God's people today through this text. What dimensions of Christ's saving office are on view here? How is the grace of that office being offered to God's people in this text? How does this grace sustain and nourish the life of faith and obedience? What particular imperatives does the text reveal and in what form are those imperatives are delivered? The imperatival force of a text may take sh shape in the form of exhortations or encouragements together with their flip sides of rebuke and warning. And just as an encouragement is only energised by the promise of God's grace, so too is the authenticity of a warning not undone by the underlying promise of perseverance. Rather, the encouragements and warnings can be proclaimed in confidence that they are the very means by which the Holy Spirit has chosen to bring his gracious promises to effect through, not in spite of, the awakened agency of those who are grafted into Christ. Unlike the Christian reader of scripture, however, the preacher is uniquely situated at the pivot point between text and congregation. That is to say, their preaching office typically arises in the context of a pastoral relationship with peculiar responsibilities to the flock. So on the one hand, they are called to set an example for the believers in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity, as Paul instructs his pupil Timothy. So in a sense, the preacher is to furnish a living application, illustrating the sanctifying effect of scripture through their own personality, their daily struggles, their joys and opportunities. As um, Karl Barth puts it, fidelity to the text is not to be a screen behind which the preacher disappears. And this is what distinguishes the sermon from the public reading of scripture. A genuinely original and faithful sermon is one in which it ought to be evident that the transforming grace of the text has first taken hold of the one declaring that grace to others. Indeed, it barely needs to be said, of course, that any serious failure in this respect is both destructive to the flock and to the honour of Christ. On the other hand, the pastor's investment in their flock furnishes a kind of stock of wisdom from which they can draw as they seek to apply the text skillfully to the diverse needs of the congregation. The shared knowledge and experience uh, of the pastor and the congregation can only heighten the preacher's sensitivity to the way in which scripture should intersect with the mind and the will and the affections of the flock. But in turn, the same common life can only enhance 
the congregation's sympathy to the way in which scripture has gripped the heart of the pastor. And I think this is the kind of mutuality to which Paul gives some striking testimony in the opening chapters of 1 Thessalonians. I mean, ideally, it looks like it does there. I mean, I realise the idea, it's, we, we often fall short of the ideal in our congregational life compared to the kind of picture that Paul paints in 1 Thessalonians. But there you get a picture of the word being proclaimed with, and so evidently corroborated and adorned by Paul's devotion for that church. Devotion which he in turn then received from them. So in all these respects then, the effectiveness of the preaching ministry rides on so much more than a preacher's intellectual or rhetorical capacities or even their expository skill as necessary and valuable as these things may be. It turns as much on a faith, preacher's faithfulness as a pastor as anything else. Indeed, like all Christian service, faithful pulpit ministry really is a subset of the sanctified life itself. Ultimately, however, any spiritual sanctifying vitality in a preacher's words is a business over which Christ alone presides by the power of his spirit, a point so eloquently demonstrated in the surprise the preacher often experiences when people respond to their sermons in ways that they didn't expect. It's a reminder, isn't it, that the, preaching, uh, the ministry of preaching must be exercised in prayerful dependence on Christ just like the sanctified life itself. And as it was for Paul, it is to be a matter of much gratitude and praise when people receive their proclamation, not as a human word, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work through, but also ultimately over and beyond the preacher in those who believe. I'll take the opportunity then, as you're thinking, to ask you just a, a question of clarification. I don't mind if there are no questions. <laughs> no, 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 no. I want to give them time to put, you know, get the hardest questions ready for you. Um, I, I was just wondering if you could repeat for me uh, and, and everyone else, um, that when you were speaking about scripture and, uh, uh, and speech act theory and, and, and faith, if you could just, just articulate again how, how does that dynamic work, um, the speech act theory, scripture and faith? Yeah. Um, so it was in the context, speech act theory um, is, it's a kind of, um, it's not an invention of theologians, it was actually an invention of English departments in the, in the mid 20th century, um, but it's been seized by theologians as a good way of trying to account for a particular kind of act um, that is performed through words. Um, and given that God seems to be doing that through Scripture. He seems to be accompli accomplishing things in our lives through Scripture. You know, it's not a bad, bad metaphor to try and understand the nature of what he's doing through Scripture. Um, and in terms of the technical vocabulary, if you have a locution, which is a sentence, an utterance, um, that's one thing. You also have a thing that is done by that sentence, by the speaker of that sentence, which is called the illocution. And then you have the effect of the thing that's done by those words in the listener, in the person um, who's being addressed. And that's called the perlocution. And so what I was trying to do um, was to illustrate, the, was to account for the way in which the spirit forms the new life within us. He grafts us into Christ, and in grafting us into Christ, he awakens our agency in the form of faith, a dependence upon Christ that honours that Christ alone foundation of our salvation that um, expresses itself in obedience to our King. Faith as the root of love, dependence on Christ as the grounds upon which we can have the strength to live the life of obedience. Um, and that's, that's, if you like, the perlocution, the effect that the Spirit produces within us. Um, it's the regenerative grace. It's looking at that work from the perspective of what God is doing within us. 
to transform us ultimately and for the likeness of Christ. But then I tried to talk about the instrumentality of the word. So if the efficiency of the, if the spirit is a, the efficient agent in producing that effect in our life, he does it through the instrument of his word. Um, it's a different kind of agency. He does it through the speech acts of scripture. Um, he does it through the speech acts of the preacher as they seek to proclaim the logic of scripture. And I was trying to say that the, the way in which God addresses us through the instrumentality of the word in terms of the speech acts that he performs in scripture corresponds to that dynamic that he's performing in our lives through the efficient agency of the spirit. And so just as faith is the root of love or faith is the root of Christian obedience, so there is, that's the perlocution, so there is a corresponding illocutionary work um, through the agency of scripture, promise that nourishes faith, then obedience, a kind of hermeneutic um, that corresponds to the work that the spirit is doing within us. Um, so that when we come to scripture, what we, as those who have been spiritually in, enlightened by this divine work through scripture, what we come to recognize, if you like, at the pointy end of what God is saying to us in Scripture are the promises grounded in the person and work of Christ, um, the priestly work of Christ that animates then a life of obedience to our King. You know, if it were just com if it were commands first, well, how does a sinner respond to commands? How does a sinner respond to the law? What does Paul say? He says our instinct is to suppress the truth. You know, if we know that God is the judge, if we know that naturally, our instinct is to hide from the judge. You know, even so, even to the point where on, the, on judgment day, people are going to be calling on the mountains to cover them. Um, our instinct is to evade that truth. Uh, and so the, the, the way in which God graciously awakens the sinner is not first through a command, but through a promise of mercy and grace in Christ. And that's what, and that, that creates faith as the root of the Christian life that corresponds to that, um, that work of Christ that he's performed on our behalf. We can't imagine, or couldn't imagine church without preaching. Are you suggesting we can imagine uh, preaching without church? Uh, absolutely, yes. You can't imagine preaching without the church. Um, I think, um, and um, I was, I've been reflecting, I don't know whether this is right. It may be a total historical anachronism. Why is it that, say, for example, the Westminster Confession isolates the significance of preaching, um, you know, in terms of the way in which God and nourishes the life of God's people, is especially through the preaching of his word, as opposed to just the reading, the address, reading out the scriptures in public. It's not denying the importance of that. But I take it that um, there's a, a living, um, in as much as the word that um, God um, uses to, by his spirit to create this new life within us, in as much as that is a living word, it's fittingly expressed in the context of a congregation uh, where the preacher, in a sense, I, you know, subordinate to the prophetic office of Christ, gets up and proclaims that living word that is um, situated in the context of a living relationship between the pastor and the flock. Um, so I don't think you can think of the preaching task apart from that relationship of pastor and the flock. Yeah. Andrew, can you comment on evangelism, the proclamation of the gospel outside of you say, the, the church? Um, yeah. Um, I think um, I think all what I, I what I was trying to say is that the pastor's preaching vocation in the context of the church is evangelistic in its character. It has to be. Um, and um, uh, because that it's the same gospel that saves that also nourishes the Christian life. 
that's what I was trying to propose. Um, but I was focusing on the congregation and the life of the congregation and the pastor's relationship to the congregation because that was, that was what I was asked to write about, um, theology of sanctification. Um, but I take it that, you know, that, that um, the New Testament also calls us to go out of the local congregation, to send missionaries, to be missionaries, um, announcing that gospel in other contexts. Um, and it's, the, it's the, the word that nourishes the Christian faith that also creates, through the Holy Spirit, creates that Christian faith, the same gospel. Um, so it's the task of the, you know, in distinction from the task of the pastor, and the pastor will be a missionary, um, but I think primarily um, their preaching office in the, is um, an office of, uh, when they're in the context of the congregation, an office of tending for the flock. Um, but all pastors are called also to exercise a ministry of evangelism as well, missionary, a missionary exercise. Um, yeah. And I, I think also, in as much as the church, I think, um, if I can use these categories, and I know some people might, might jump on me for this, um, in as much as the visible church... <laughs> is a bit of a mixed bag. Um, we, we treat people as Christians because they make professions. We also recognise that in the context of the life of the congregation, there are those who are unregenerate. Um, the, um, you know, the 1 Corinthians, the idiot in our midst, <laughs> the outsider, um, the, the, the person who comes into the life of the congregation um, uh, who's not a Christian, not professing faith. And so there's always an evangelistic, um, a missionary um, task or function um, in the context of even ministry within the local congregation. Apart from David Peterson's writing, uh, what is a good book to read on the question of sanctification? Um... The sanctification, I think, is sort of... Uh, it's been something that mm, evangelicals have... Um, I, I dare I say it, I think, neglected a bit um, as, as a doctrine. Um, and um, there's been a bit of controversy in the, Ameri in the American kind of scene... Um, uh, you know, accusations of antinomianism and all sorts of things flowing out of the Gospel Coalition. Um, but I, what I've detected, I think, in the, in, the, in the last 10 years or so, maybe even less, last five years, is a renewed interest in, in a doctrine of sanctification. And so there's books like Michael Allen's book on um, sanctification that's appeared in the last couple of years that are really quite extensive treatments of this subject. Um, you know, I... I I, I, I'd be neglectful if I didn't wave the flag for good old John Owen mm -hmm. and um, his um, mortification, for example. Is, but he didn't just write that book, which he's probably most famous for. Uh, he actually wrote three treatises on dealing with sin in the Christian life. I mean, mortif the mortification of sin, which John Owen wrote to um, university students... Uh, in Oxford when he was the Vice-Chancellor of Oxford. Um, I think he was thoroughly sick of them. So he wrote these three, um, you know, as Robert Doyle would say, they put hairs on your chest. But um, they're, they're quite formidable and relentless in some ways. But even in mortification where he's gone through, where you've, you're kind of left with nowhere to hide when it comes to the, the, the reality of sin in our lives, you know, nowhere to hide. He just pulls apart. He takes down every prop, every refuge that we, by virtue of the fact of that lingering um, presence of sin in our lives, will hide in um, so that we're left with nowhere to hide. But he says the chief work, if you like, in sanctification, in mortif mortifying the desires of the flesh, is faith in Christ and faith in his promises. Um, and um, so it's, it's a wonderful way to end that book. 
Um, so I think, I think you know, that that's a classic treatment. A modern treatment would be something like Michael Allen's book. Partly appreciation for the depth of reflection on, on application, but then a, a question. What is application? <laughs> I feared someone might ask that. Um, thank you, Lionel. Um, I think application in the end is, is the address of the gospel, um, and that dynamic of promise and then imperative, the address of the, the, the identity of Christ in his, you know, in his office of priest at the pointy end, prophet and king, um, to the life of the congregation, but through the particulars of a given text. Um, and, um, you know, another a whole book needs to be written on that, you know, how that, how that you do that from any particular text. I mean, that's just, as I say, it's, it's well out of mind. Some of you are far more practised and skilled at doing that than, than I am. Um, but I think that's the essence of it in every... And I, I, I think if you do that in any sermon, um, you've, you've, you've been faithful to your calling. Um, if you don't do that in your sermon, I don't think you've been faithful to the calling of what application, what your task is as a preacher to apply scripture to people's lives. Um, and I think, you know, I was thinking, you know, I made a point about the fact that you do it in a way that reflects the, the particulars of the text that it's in front of you. Um, you could have a text that extols the, the greatness and the majesty of God's character. But as you speak about the character of God, you can only speak about the character of God through the prism of Christ, the Christ who's revealed that character to us. And how has that Christ revealed that character to us? Through the gracious work um, that he has... Um, accomplished on our behalf through his mercy towards us. Um, but as you speak about the glory and the majesty of God in Christ, um, that sense of gratitude that is at the heart of faith will also have, um, um, will also animate repentance and, um, and change, I think, you know, in ways that fittingly ought to correspond to the character of God, um, that, that expose the gap, as it were, between our character and the character of God. So that's a, you know, there's a text that on the surface may not have a lot of commands, but still it's the same dynamic, I think. Um, and then you might have, you preach a sermon on the Ten Commandments, um, which at you know, that, that they're the commands are front and centre. Nonetheless, I, I think you can only apply that, the logic of the Ten Commandments through the prism of the, the, the priestly work of Christ and the, that, that same gospel promise then command sort of dynamic. Um, and I think any given text, you know, no matter how small, no matter how big, will have that. Um, at its heart. Um, and that's, I think, what um, Protestant dogmaticians meant when they talked about Christ as the scope of Scripture. Um, yeah. Sorry, that's, that's an inadequate answer. It's a good answer. We come and ask Andrew if, if you have any more questions. Can we thank Andrew for his... Uh, quick, uh...